Hello and welcome back to the second webinar from the Wandsworth Autism Advisory Service. My name's Amy Hopkins. And I'm Dr Siobhan Higgy. Um, and today we're continuing with our second webinar on behaviours that challenge. Our focus last time was on understanding your child and today we shall be focusing on understanding behaviour. Last week we talked a little bit about the functions of behaviour. As a reminder, we spoke about how all behaviour happens for a reason. That your child will behave in a particular way, either to gain access to something that they want, to avoid or escape something they don't want, to gain social attention, to gain sensory stimulation, or to get relief from pain or discomfort. The aims of today's session are to understand precursors and antecedents to behaviour how anxiety and stress can impact behaviour, arousal states, and using a low arousal approach. And just like last week, we should be setting a short homework task at the end. To help deepen our understanding of why your child might behave in a particular way, it is helpful for us to think about what happens before and what happens after they show a particular behaviour. Um, when talking about behaviours, often something called an ABC chart is used, um, and that looks at antecedents, the behaviour and consequences, so what comes after. What we're going to do is we're going to look at a, a layer even before that again, and we're going to look at something called precursors. So precursors are signs that the behaviour might be about to occur. So, so t the way, the best way to, I guess, think about it is think about it as like a micro behaviour of what the challenging behaviour might be, um, or, or also maybe thinking of it as like a warning flag. Um, so there, there are little behaviours that might be a sign that your child is about to behave in a particular way, um, and we're also going to think a little bit about antecedents. An antecedent is just a fancy word for the word trigger. Um, so what is happening right before your child behaves in a certain way? What it, it might be that something uh, has changed in the environment or something unexpected or unwanted is due to happen. Um, and and it, is a, it is a trigger that can result in escalated behavior um, and, and the potential for real meltdown. Um, the, the, and also deepening our understanding, we also think a little bit about consequences. Um, and consequences is what happens after uh, the behaviour. So it links back to what we talked about last week in terms of thinking about the, the function of behaviour. So what did that behaviour represent a, a way of avoiding something that the child didn't want to do? Was it about gaining more attention? Um, or any of the other functions that we talked about last week and just recapped uh, a couple of minutes ago. Um, but for today, we're really just going to think about micro behaviours and triggers, so precursors and antecedents. The first signs of, of behaviour uh, will differ for every child, and it can depend on the situation or how they are feeling. Some signs to look out for can include pacing, fiddling, rocking, talking to themselves, biting their nails, their feet getting hot, making noises, flapping their hands a little, clenching jaws or fists, becoming very still. And this is not an exhaustive list. These are just some examples of what those first micro behaviours might look like. And it might be useful for you to use the parent observation sheet that we sent last week to explore some of the first signs that your child might be struggling. So helping you to identify what are those micro behaviours. Stress and anxiety can play a big role in both precursor and antecedent stage. And often they're quite big provokers to difficult behaviours. Stress is seen as a reaction to a specific event. We know what's worrying us, and this can have long-term effects. However, anxiety is a reaction that stems from fear, the nature of which we can't always define or specify. And I guess it's a little bit like the example, the Tokyo example I gave last week. 
that we we know that we're worried, but we're not necessarily sure why. And a lot of our children often have low levels of anxiety because it's it's difficult to navigate um, the world around us um, and and the world around them. Um, and and so if they're carrying through with low levels of anxiety. Um, it's helpful for us to think about how how we respond when we're feeling anxious and what that looks like to help us to understand how we go from low level micro behaviors to meltdown. This is called uh, the the arousal cycle or the course of arousal. It's also known as as the firework model. And what it looks at is it, it looks at how a child is presenting at a baseline. So when I say presenting, from the outside looking in, it looks like they are quite calm. Um, they are engaged in something. They aren't seeming to be showing any any level of, of distress. Um, and if we think about the, the firework model, it helps us think about well, that child that is presenting calm and how they can escalate before going back down to being calm again. So if we think about stage one and we think about we've got we've got a firework um, and now the match is lit. So the trigger or the antecedent has occurred and that has increased an arousal response. And that might be more anxiety, it might be more excitement, it might be more anger, it might be more worry, but it has triggered a response. And then we move into stage two, and that is the arousal building. So that's that's the fuse being lit, and the fuse now burning through um, towards the firework. Um, and the time scales for for how quickly that arousal builds, that arousal builds uh, is dependent on additional triggers or antecedents. So it might be that the child is feeling hungry, or the child is feeling uh, more tired. Um, or uh, there's a lot of language going on and so they're finding themselves more irritable um, or they really want to continue doing what they're doing and so they're maybe feeling quite confused um, and those are those are additional triggers to, to the to the original one and that can that can very quickly ensure that the arousal builds or the arousal dampens down stage three is is the meltdown phase for want of another term so that's the, the firework has gone off it's gone into the sky and it has exploded um and the, uh, at, at that point it's it can be very difficult to intervene because there is a real sense of loss of control for the young person but also for anybody that that is is trying to support in that moment um and then if we think about stage four the arousal level drops so this is the firework has gone off into the sky, it's exploded, and now it's beginning to fall back down towards Earth. And in stage four, this is this is where we we if we're not careful, we might miss it fireworking again. We might miss that there's a second flare, um, and that uh, because another stressor might come in that can cause the arousal to peak again. So, for example, using too much language when the child is beginning to come back down again could cause them to go back up or cause the firework to go off again. Um, and so the, this is the stage where we need to be quite careful. And stage five is uh, the arousal level dropping quite sharply. So this can be where you see your child presenting unhappy, sleepy, tired. They might become quite withdrawn. Um, quite still, um, and that's when when the behaviour has they've they've expended all of their energy, and the behaviour is now tailing off um, because they've used so much energy, they're now almost going into a state of needing to be replenished again. And once they have had that space to replenish, and and to help them to calm, we go back to baseline again, um, and that is your child presenting in a calm um, and relaxed way. In thinking about the arousal cycle, it's helpful to think about the lower uh, ha having a, a low arousal approach. 
Um, it's important to, to meet your child's sensory needs and it's important to think about how is the environment and not only how is the environment but, but how is the interactions, how are they between, between the child and, and the person um, that is trying to support. Um, and it might be helpful to think about auditing the environment and the people that are present. So what is going on in that stage two when the fuse is lit all the way up until meltdown and into stage four where we think it's about to, 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 to begin to calm and then it goes off again. So what is going on? Who is around? Is there a lot of noise happening? Is it uh, very bright? Um, is there a lot of language happening? Is it very hot in the room? Um, and trying to reduce some of those external factors can have, can have a positive effect. It's also important to promote clear and calm communication um, when, when in, engaging a child and trying to reduce their arousal state. And very importantly, the low arousal approach really encourages the child to begin to self-identify and engage in self-calming strategies. So that might be that they that they rock or they pace or they jump um, or they have a, a safe, quiet space that they go to. But it's important that they, they begin to self-identify um, what strategy works for them so that as they're coming down, um, at stage four and into stage five that they're feeling calm. It's also helpful to think about what are those self-calming strategies that are really effective for your child, particularly at stage two. So after they've been triggered and you've seen some of those micro behaviors where you think this could result in, in a very large and challenging behavior, um, thinking about that, that stage two and are there some of those self-calming strategies that we could put in place in order to, to almost pour water on the fuse before it hits the, the firework and the firework goes off? So really doing some thinking about how to engage um, in self-calming strategies and, and how to get our, our children and young people to think about that. And what I'll say is this, this is not an overnight cure to behaviour. But if it is used consistently, the low arousal approach, it, it can have a very positive um, and long-lasting impact on behaviour. So thinking about triggers, it might be quite hard to think about, but there are times when we as people in your child's environment can be possible stressors or triggers. Um, and in thinking about how you might sometimes be a potential trigger uh, towards some of your child's heightened arousal, it's helpful to think about language and communication strategies to use when, when a child becomes particularly upset. Uh, so first of all, using fewer words, language places an incredible demand um, on our brains and particularly when we're in a very heightened state of arousal, it can be really, really difficult to process all of that language. So reducing the amount of words that you're using, the complexity of your language can be really, really helpful. So keeping it simple, keeping it short um, and repeating if needed. Uh, trying to avoid words and phrases or particular sounds that you know can cause distress. You'll know your child well to know if there are particular things that you say to them that might cause a bit of a flare up um, or if there are particular noises that really, really grate on them um, and can make them quite irritable. Uh, not insisting on eye contact. Children with autism find eye contact can find eye contact particularly in, intense and, and quite uh, intimidating um, and having that expectation of them maintaining eye contact uh, can actually be a trigger because it's a very neurotypical expectation um, that somebody looks at you when you're talking to them but for young people with autism it's like I said a very very intensive feeling so if they're already at that slightly bubbly fizzy stage where their, their rocket's potentially going to ignite um, it might be a time to not insist on them looking at you um, and just because someone's not looking at you doesn't mean that they're, they're not necessarily listening to you um, or paying attention. 
Um, and so it's just helpful to keep that in mind. Also being aware of your own voice and, and the pitch of your voice, you know, are you coming across particularly critical in tone or, or very aggressive? Um, and equally, young people with autism can have particular sensory sensitivities to pitch. So very high pitch voices can be quite quite difficult for them to, to listen to. Um, so thinking about just monitoring the tone of, and the pitch of your voice when you're speaking to them, if they're in that bubbly st um, stage. And next, being aware that for some young people there can be processing delays um, and it can take a little bit of extra time for them to think about and process what, what it is you've said. So if you give an instruction and they're not responding immediately, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're choosing to ignore you or um, are not paying attention. It could be that at that time it's taking their brain that little bit longer to process the language that you're using um, and to think about what it is that you've said and what it is you're demanding of them um, and what they therefore need to do. So giving them a little bit of extra time to respond or repeating something can be quite helpful. And the next one, explaining what's happening for your child. As we said before, anxiety really stems from feeling uncomfortable or being in a position of uncertainty, not really knowing what's going on. So explaining to your child what is happening and maybe why it's happening can be really helpful in creating a, a, a safer feeling for them so that they have a little bit more security in what's happening and knowing what's going on. And finally, uh, using visuals if you have them available. Uh, visuals don't have to be complicated, they can be photographs, they can be little stick people drawings, um, little doodles, they can even be physical objects uh, to use. Anything that means that you can show your child something without having to necessarily use any language. Um, and particularly if they're finding the language quite difficult to process, it can be helpful to use a visual to help represent or illustrate what it is you're asking them to do. So, for example, if you're wanting them to take their plate into the kitchen, holding up a plate and kind of indicating towards the kitchen can be really, really helpful um, in supporting them to know what it is that you're asking without putting on all those demands in communication. <clears throat> Excuse me. So in moments of heightening stress or arousal, your child is reliant on you to support them to lower their arousal levels. And it's important that you feel calm in order to promote something we call co-regulation. Co-regulation is a really important step towards helping people to be able to self-regulate. It's something that we start off early with with babies when we're saying to them, um, oh, you, you look hungry, are you, are you thirsty, would you like some milk, do you need your nappy changing, where it takes somebody else to begin identifying some of the feelings um, or some of the emotions that they may um, be experiencing. And through co-regulation, people begin to build up an understanding of what, what it is that they're experiencing in their bodies or in, in their minds um, and helps to lead towards them being able to do it independently in self-regulation. Um, and there's lots of scientific research over the last decade or so uh, which looks at how using another person or co-regulating um, can be really helpful, particularly looking at something called mirror neurons in attachment between parents and their children. Um, which shows that if, if we've got a good attunement with our child and if we're feeling calm, our child will imitate this and those mirror neurons will also mirror what's going on in, in a child's brain or mirror what's going on in the adult's brain. Um, and this is why we referred to attunement last week because if the child's reading cues from you that suggest their environment's safe, then they too are likely to feel safe and can calm down more quickly. So to help with co-regulation, it can be helpful to practice some calming and relaxation strategies. Um, we divide these into strategies to help with our breathing um, and strategies to help um, release some of the tension in muscles. Uh, and it's quite difficult for me to, to demonstrate at the moment, but I'll, I'll quickly explain it. Um, some of the different strategies that you might like to have a go at trying with your child. 
Um, my hope is to record some examples of these and put them up onto our YouTube page, which you can access through the local offer. So do keep checking in there um, for, for that. But finger breathing involves holding up your hand and like a high five, as though you're about to high five, and simply tracing the outline of your fingers one by one. And every time you go up a finger to breathe in, and every time you go down the finger to breathe out. Bubble breathing, you can either do with a, an actual pot of bubbles and just blow some bubbles, um, can be quite relaxing. Um, or if you don't have that, imagining that you're trying to blow up a big bubble, like a chewing gum bubble, so big that it ends up bursting. And then muscle relaxation um, can be really helpful, particularly for young people with autism, because sometimes focusing on breathing and being quite mindful of that can feel quite intensive, particularly if they've got um, particular sensory sensitivities. But sometimes um, with muscle relaxation, you squeeze and tense up different muscles uh, in turn and then feel some release and relief um, when you let go. Um, and some of the things that I found helpful is, is comparing them to, to animals. So things like stretching your neck out and pretending you're a giraffe and trying to eat the leaves on the top of the trees um, or trying to be a tortoise and hiding, pulling yourself right into your shell and hunching your shoulders up to your ears. Um, or another one that children particularly like is um, clenching your fists really, really tight and imagining that you're trying to make lemonade by squeezing all of the lemon juice out of the lemon. Um, and it's just important to try and find a calm time uh, to practice these with your child. You're looking for a time when they're, they're already quite calm um, and it's not going to be potentially triggering to stop them what they're already doing. So if they're having fun watching their favourite TV programme um, and they're already quite, even though they might be quite relaxed already, interrupting an enjoyable activity might not be the best uh, time to do it. But things like just before bed or after dinner, times when they're naturally winding down, uh, it might be a helpful time to have a go at practising some of these. So homework for this week. We've got two homework tasks, the first of which is thinking about the arousal stages again. Um, and we're, what we're asking is that you complete a description of what each stage looks like for your child. So thinking about that baseline and thinking about what does that look like for your child? What are they doing? Um, what suggests that, that they are calm um, and relaxed? Uh, and then thinking about stage one, stage two, stage three and stage four. What does that look like when they initially become triggered? What are those micro behaviours that we were talking about? And in stage two, as we're beginning to see the, as we're beginning to see arousal build, what does that look like for your young person? And what does what does the meltdown look like before we see it taper off? And in thinking about what it looks like for your child and how they're experiencing it, we're also asking, what do you do in that moment? How, how are you supporting? What does that look like? What strategies do you have when your child is calm and relaxed? What strategies do you have when, when you notice a micro behavior? What, what are you doing? What are you saying? Where are you? When is it happening? Just thinking about those things. And we'd like you to think about a particular behavior um, and begin to think about some strategies. And, and don't worry if, if you get stuck along the way, because next week we're going to be focusing on appropriate st strategies across different phases of the arousal cycle and thinking about what might work in a particular uh, situation and instance next week. And that brings us to the second homework task, which is simply to choose one of the calming strategies that I mentioned before and just have a go. Practice them with your child. Um, and like we said, it's important to practice this when you're already feeling calm, which may seem a little counterintuitive. Um, but for anyone to learn a new skill, we need to be calm and regulated. Um, and it's only through practice when we're in that kind of a state that we might be able to then use that strategy um, when feeling a little more dysregulated. Um, so just try to practice five minutes each day um, and choose a time of day that, that works best. That's it for this week. 
Uh, if you've had any questions or um, comments or about the content today or the homework, please feel free to drop us an email at autismadvisory at wandsworth.gov.uk. Um, but otherwise, we look forward to seeing you next week. Thanks very much for joining us. Take care. Bye-bye.